Okay, everybody, welcome to Who's Your Band? And today's guest we have with us right now from Gutting the Sacred Cow podcast and the host of Comics Watching Comics on Amazon Prime. We are joined right now by Kevin Goatee. Kevin, how are you? Hey, boys, how are you? Not only a host, but the producer as well, correct? The producer, the CEO, the the editor, the head fluffer, caterer, everything I fucking do on that show, on all of those Love shows it. pretty much. Yeah, it's it's a DIY effort over here. Awesome. You know, we also left out another one of your credits. You're also the host of the Fancy Football Jibber Jabber. Yeah, and creator. So yeah, it's uh, the hat trick right there, the Holy Trinity. So you're keeping pretty busy during this uh, this time off, huh? Very much so. The, the pandemic, I mean, it's been fucking terrible for a myriad of reasons. But I like to make hay while the sun shines. In fact, like I, was, I was telling you, of course, Jeff, as we talk every few days, I've gotten so much shit done for gutting the sacred cow in regards to all the, the clerical bullshit behind the scenes work that had to be done. The pandemic afforded me that opportunity to get all that shit knocked out. We got the website up and running. We got the merch shop up and running. We're able to edit videos a lot faster, turn things a hell of a round, brainstorm things and, and, and implement them a lot faster than if, you know, Kevin Israel and I, my co-host, were just still at our regular nine to five jobs every day. So for people who aren't sure, I was a guest on it. Uh, tell people exactly what is Gutting the Sacred Cow? Great question. Gutting the Sacred Cow is a show where we're two film snobs and we like having opinions about films and we like to invite guests, you know, podcasters or other comics to come on who also have very distinguished and uh, quasi expert views like we do. And we like, but here's the twist between us and every other podcast. We are movie podcast. We have the guests pick a film that they hate or find insanely overrated, but that film has to meet one of these criteria. And it has to be a financial success or Give widely us an beloved, example. or critically acclaimed. So one of those three criteria it has to meet. Give us an example. This week we just did Scream with Juliet Miranda. Next week we had Tia Fady from Geek Vibes Nation doing Batman versus Superman. Last or two weeks ago, we had Anthony Cumia doing Face Off. So that, and the three weeks before that, we had um, James Gassy doing Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So we run the gamut. You know, Jeff, was, was this the show that you did Spaceballs? Yes, this it is was. the show that I argued about Spaceballs. I, this is the show where I, you know, I, I've hated you for a long time. Don't get me wrong. But when I found out that you hate Spaceballs, it, it brought out such a venom and a hatred inside of me that thank God I haven't seen you since you taped this because I would seriously punch you in the face for hating you. You cannot Spaceballs. possibly like Spaceball. That is one of my all time favorite movies. Fuck, how is that possible? And this I've is never what seen we did Star on, Wars. This is what we did on Gutting the Sacred Cow. Okay. We argued this with such passion. Okay. Because it is such a f piece of shit. You you can't be a comedian and think those jokes were funny. Oh, you thought those were is, funny? It is a classic movie. It's not a classic. It's, it's one John, of his. John, it's, John, it's one John. of his. Oh. It's, a, it's a piece of shit. I agree one hundred percent with him. Oh fuck you too, really. Ke it Kevin, is Ke Kevin Israel loves it. So and it's funny. We both we are, we're we're both for and against that movie. Is a fucking slog. It is lazy, oh. schmaltzy, and I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Huge. It was desert dog shit. That's funny too. Combing the desert with giant combs. That's funny. Yeah. Yes. There are moments. <laughs> My favorite scene is where he goes, What am I ass? Get that man some Pepto Bismol. That's the fun when the alien pops out. Jesus Christ. Oh, I that was the, that ending movie. was the worst. The only uh, thing missing was a spinning bow tie and someone spraying each other in the face with seltzer water bottles. That's the only uh, thing missing that fucking piece of shit. Oh, uh, this show's going fucking down real quick. I still remember <laughs> taping that episode. Kevin's whole argument was it's supposed to be that way. It's a, it's supposed to be a pile of shit. Yeah. Stop it. That movie is awful. A uh, great Kevin parody. The, 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 the best two parody <laughs> films ever made are Naked Gun and Airplane. Either or, I'll accept. I prefer Naked Gun. But when you say that, that's a parody movie. Scary Movie is a better parody movie than what Spaceballs was for Star Wars. Not even close. Okay. So what's a movie that you like? What's a movie that you uh, is like one of your favorites? You know, whether it be uh, a sports movie, a comedy movie, what's, what kind of movie? I'll, do you, I'll like? do you one better. I'll give you my top five so Morton can, can uh, try and assail me. Number one. And the first two are in exact order. The next three are in non, non, no specific order. My favorite film of all time is Caddyshack. Go ahead. I dare you. Great okay. movie. Yeah. Number two is Pulp Fiction. Again. One of my top five, too. There you go. Star Wars, number three. 
Never seen it. You know I hate well, it. Oh, there we go. Matrix number four. Never seen it. Never seen it. Wow. Are you fucking serious? No. And I'm going to say The Dark Knight is number five. Great. There you go. <laughs> oh, you like it? Who does? Yeah. I, I never seen it. I don't watch. I don't like comic movies. book movies, you know. I, I don't. I'm not a nerd. I'm sorry. Terror, I but that. I'm not a nerd. That's that's his whole argument, Sean. I, well, I, I don't, don't watch it. When he was growing up, they didn't have comic books. That's why. <laughs> what on hieroglyphics? <laughs> if, I, on Sean, if I told you the comic books I li- I used to read, you would laugh at me. I know Daffy Duck, Heathcliff. No, oh, even worse, even worse. Richie Rich. Were you an I Archie survived. fan? I used to read Richie Rich. I used to read Archie. Oh my god! Of course you did. What's the matter? Was Dennis the Menace sold out that day? I used to like Dennis the Menace too. Who did? There you go. It was that was funny. It was funny. So besides uh, movies and sports, you know, you're you're a pretty big music guy as well, aren't you? I am. I'm a really big music guy, and it sucks because, and I think Morton, you, I I might have seen you are going to attend this concert too. I was, and Jeff, you were coming with me. Guns N' Roses got canceled. I don't know when this is going to air, but it was yeah. as this as this airs, I had tickets to go see them again on July fifteenth at a uh, Giant Stadium, and I'm not happy. I still have tickets to see Ramstein in September. I'm not a Ramstein guy. That, My that ain't happening. That's canceled. Well, no, right? the the European leg was canceled. Did they finally no. cancel the Northern? Yeah, North America's did. canceled too. Yeah, that's not going to happen. God damn it. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty pissed off that uh that you know I'm missing some concerts. But you know, my fan my so who's my band? I'll jump right to the chase. My two favorite ones in Jefferson, do this one because you know it's more um, I guess across the board understood and recognized is Nirvana. My second, I guess one A and one B. One B is bad religion for me. I've seen them, I don't know, 15 fucking times. I love bad religion. It's my favorite Great band. band. Yeah. But Nirvana is my band I'm choosing for today. That's love- great because that was my one of my favorite bands. Uh, throughout high school and uh, into college as well. Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot still, about that. Love them. In fact, people say, "What? Do you, what? Like some of your regrets in life?" My regrets of people I have not seen live: Nirvana and Rodney Dangerfield, two misses I have on my on my docket. I were not able to go see in person. I, I saw Nirvana. I saw Where? Nirvana. Reading? Ro- no, Roseland. 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 Roseland Ballroom. Me too. But you, what? What year is this? Ni- uh, 90, 93. 93. 93. Yeah. So it was in utero tour then. In okay. utero tour. Yeah. Yes. Which yeah. we're going to talk about how in utero is a far superior album than Nevermind is, by the way. Sean, I cannot agree with you more. Good. See, this is a good, this is what, this is what it's supposed to be like, Jeff. <laughs> Just, I think in, in, in utero is so much better. It, it, don't get me wrong. It's great. Never mind. But in utero is I think far they're both, superior. I think they're both great. My favorite song is on in utero. Mine too. Which one? Hot Shape Box. I chose one that's off the beaten path, and that is Setless Apprentice. Oh, my, my God. I used to rip that shit apart on the guitar because it was four notes. Exactly. <laughs> and the fucking drumming on that is so intense. I love it. It's just the opening. Oh, it was a great, great song. Did you, did you happen? And now, a lot of people didn't like this, and a lot of people did. Did you catch the uh, Post Malone live stream? I did catch it after a bunch of people were on Facebook saying how great it was, and they were right. It was amazing. I I'm loved it for so, so many glad reasons. You said that, yeah. Jeff, he you know chose- who Post Malone is? Yeah, I know who Post Malone is. Well, a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't because he's this big hip hop guy, and you know, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of his. I've always been since. Uh, I didn't catch the first album on the front side. I caught the second album, and I was out in L.A. and that was the uh, only album I listened to for like six days out in LA. I must've played it 50 times and I just, I fell in love with it. Then I started reading more and more about him, how he was just so influenced by hard rock and metal. And a lot of people say that, you know what I mean? Like Lady Gaga is the same thing. Like her favorite band in the world is Anthrax, which is very strange considering the music that she puts out. But then I saw that he was going to be doing a, a thing with Aerosmith on one of the, I think it was Grammys or something like that. And he was on the guitar and just ripping it. And I was like, holy shit, this guy's for real. Then I see the uh, Nirvana live set, and he had Travis Barker from Blink-182 playing drums Great for him. Drummer. And, uh, man, not that he sounded like him. You know, not that he sounded like him, but he did it justice. He did. And, and he played guitar on top of it, too. So he played guitar, and he sang, and he dressed up like Kurt in a dress, basically. I loved how he didn't play 
the the smells like teen spirit the true right. hits he went a little below the cut territorial pissings i was like yes he exactly. fucking gets Great it song and i laughed my balls off when they were looking at the live stream and i didn't i didn't catch the guy who was playing bass the asian dude and he goes holy shit chris Novelcheck's watching he goes sorry chris I laughed my balls off when he said that. Laughed my balls off. And we're going to take a second here, and we're going to welcome in our second guest for today from the 1986 New York Mets, and he disappeared for a second. But we're going to welcome in Ed Hearn. Ed, can you hear us, Ed? He has a drive through headset on. He can't hear. Ed, wave, wave to us if you can hear us. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, he's giving us peace symbols. Oh. Can you hear us? And he's going to check things out. We'll keep talking about Nirvana while uh, he fixes his audio. I think um, I, I think that Bleach didn't get as much credit as it deserved. It was a very underrated album. Mm -hmm. uh, made for $606, by the way. That's wow. how much it cost to make that album. And uh, they went through like 13 drummers before uh, they decided on, on Dave Grohl. Right. You know, which I thought was, which was very, very interesting because usually it's the bass player that's flaky. <laughs> <laughs> a shout out to my bass player. That's why I said that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think once, you know, people use the whole Smells Like Teen Spirit as like the changing of the guard, I guess. Right. As far as going from hair metal to that. And it's very cliche. It's very, very cliche. But I will tell you, like that song changed me. It absolutely changed me. I can remember being a sophomore in high school playing that on my yellow Sony Walkman. <laughs> every one, single too. day the sportsman the sports one yeah yeah every single day and just memorizing every single guitar line on that every single bass line just memorizing it uh just for years and years and years and you look back on it now and it, it really is true like that one song really did start a complete revolution it did i mean again. it opened and up Pearl Pearl James, sound garden alice and change all those great bands i mean that's the reason why can you know yeah. How you doing, Ed? I hope you can hear me. There we now go. we got there you. There we go. I, All right. Can you hear it? Can I'm, you hear it? I'm, I'm better if you hear me and don't see me. That's not true. Well, unfortunately, I can see you, Ed. So. All right. Well, we'll just go with that for now. I don't know which one you're seeing me on. I got both going, but so uh, I got my uh, got my boys here in the background. Those are my background singers. Now, did you take care of all those things yourself, or did you just buy them like that? I ran them down, killed them with a Bowie knife. Hmm. Ed Hearn looks like if Barry Ribs actually took care of himself. What about that guy? <laughs> yeah, that's a comedian. That's yeah, a comedian reference. Yeah. And, he, and, and, he, comedians, Ed. and he looks like Dr. Emmett Brown from Back to the Future, but with less hope and future. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this crazy guy? Uh, his name is Kevin Goatee. He's a fellow <laughs> comedian of ours, Ed. Kevin, nice meeting you, man. Hey, Ed, how are you? Nice to meet you, too. How are you? Well, you know, when I when I heard they were having a comedian on, I thought it was one of the, the Mets from, like, 62 or something was joining us. From oh, they can't get Zoom on a flip phone, Ed. That's the only thing. <laughs> They're the clowns, you know. The yeah. And Dykstra's probably in jail somewhere, too, so that leaves a couple options out of there now. Oh, I'm working on getting him on the show. Don't worry about that. <laughs> oh, good luck you know, that. Yeah. Kevin and I used to do a podcast together, and our first guest in studio was Lenny. And really? Yeah, Shot out of a cannon. Oh, yeah. And that wound up, when Lenny wrote his book, um, he wound up doing a, a, a book premiere and a show over at the Gramercy Theater, and he had me and Rich Voss uh, on the show with him. So I, I, and I've hung out with Lenny many a night, man. He is, he's, he's a character. But let's get into Ed Hearn a little bit. Ed, so you grew up in Florida, correct? Yes, sir. Southeast coast of Florida. And yeah. was was baseball the only sport that you concentrated or did you play other sports? It is amazing how many people think that in Florida we play 482 games a year. <laughs> uh, it's just, oh, well, you play baseball year round. I'm like, oh, come on. No, I played football, uh, baseball, golf even. And, um, you know, I actually wanted to be an NFL quarterback. But, is that uh, what you played in high school? Yep. Uh, I did after I had a couple of death threats for being the first white quarterback in history of my school. Wow. Those Asians are vicious, aren't they, Ed? I they, tell you. They haven't telling you what they are. <laughs> and did you get any offers in college to play uh, uh, football, or was it baseball the sport that you really shined in? 
well, baseball, you know, it began to, you know, take over because uh, the school where I played, we had a great football program, but I was more of a pro style, drop back, you know, uh, and throw it. I was 6'3", 205, you know, more of a pro style, and never used to run right, run left, and, and Ed gets the first down by throwing, you know. So, uh, but I did have some opportunities. I had uh, uh, three Ivy League schools that wanted me to play football. I had an appointment and nomination to the West Point Military Academy for football uh, and some smaller colleges. Uh, but, you know, in the end, the baseball kind of came to the forefront. Well, you were catcher, I, I got to tell you one thing. We, we, we have one thing in common. I'm also 6'3", but I haven't seen 205 since Bush Sr. was in office. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have neither, so don't worry about it. 6'3 <laughs> also describes Jeff Paul's mullet right now. <laughs> and there we go. Okay. Um, Everyone's laughing. Yeah. Everyone's laughing, but Jeff. There you go. There Thank we, you guys. Yeah. Well, Thank it's you. not a model. It's not really a model. Okay. So anyway, so <laughs> hey, so you're you're playing you're playing baseball, and eventually you're drafted by the Phillies, correct? Yeah. 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 So how did you did you wind up when you were in the minor leagues? Did you play with anybody of note, like maybe like someone like a, a Ryan Sandberg or someone like that? Oh yeah, I had uh, Ryan Sandberg was my my uh, roommate on the Oh, get out of here! Wow. Oh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, R Ryan was a great guy. Him and I shared uh, team MVPs that year in Helena, Montana. It was a fabulous year because it was, in addition to me and Ryan being there, that made it fabulous, but uh, it was <laughs> uh, the first time they'd ever had a minor league team there. So these, these people up in Montana, they thought we were gods. It was unbelievable how, how awesome we were treated. It was just really a phenomenal thing. I, I tell you one story. It was, it was really great. Uh, the first home run I hit um, to straightaway center field there at home in, in Helena, I round second base and I and I kind of glance up toward our third our manager at third base, and the stands are empty. I mean, people are are bolting like there's an earthquake. I'm like, what the heck? I round third. Well, what's up, Larry? He didn't have time to tell me. I ran, got in the dugout, and said, "What's going on, guys?" He goes, "Oh, you don't know, man." When you hit it over the center field wall there, they opened the beer taps until the last outs made. So I did, <laughs> I did that about five times, man. That's and oh, great. they love me. I think that's probably why they voted me MVP. It was the <laughs> most valuable beer producer. That's <laughs> you take that, MVP, Ryan yeah. Sandberg. There you, you got go. that over at Ryan Sandberg, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, together, he got one, the one voted upon by the players, and I got the one voted on by the fans. So. And I'm sure it was because of the beer. <laughs> so how did you wind up on the uh, New York Mets? How did you wind up in that organization? Well, right after that great year at Helen, I went to Structure League, and uh, I, my shoulder was bothering me. I, I went to Philly. They did surgery, and then I had a nerve go bad in my back, and that cost me all of that following year. And I'm trying to get ready to come back and play some ball, and I had been on the field in, in almost a year and a half. And I got in a little scrimmage with my, one of my, old high, my high school team, and stupid me, you know, why slide anyway? But then to change your mind in the middle of the slide. <laughs> oh, I mean, oh. So you so, rip up your legs. Yep. The ankle was just destroyed. Uh, they flew me back to Philly. And essentially, the, the, Dr. Moreau, the Phillies doctor, <clears throat> stitched me up. But he told the, the Phillies organization that I, I may not walk normally again, let alone catch. So the, for the next four or five years, they kept me. In the organization, so I could hit, but I played DH first base, and finally, after six years, I said, "Look, man, let's let's be men about this. I got some brains. I got other things besides baseball. I'm not one of those guys that this is all I got. And let's give my release. And if nobody will let me catch in baseball, I'm going. I'm going out in the real world, and I'm going to make something else happen. And so they gave my release, and the Mets offered me the opportunity to catch split time in 1983. Where did you Where did you wind up going? Uh, I went to Lynchburg. The great year in Lynchburg. Where we and what, won, what, what uh, level is that? that? Is that single that's A? Class, class A ball again. Yeah, where I had been the MVP so you, in that. So you had a, you had all these years in the minors, and now you're almost starting right from the beginning again. Exactly. But the great wow. thing was that was the team that was uh, Dwight Gooden, Lenny Dykstra, Mark Carrion, Randy Milligan. We had an uh, unbelievable amount of guys that played the big leagues. So we won that year, and uh, that was the year Lenny stole 100 bases in a minor league season. Uh, Doc won 300, uh, he had 300 strikeouts in a minor league season. Uh, it was absolutely phenomenal. It was just, uh, so we win there and, you know, you guys may or may not have heard, but 
the line on Ed Hearn is he's the only professional baseball player to win four straight rings, trophies, every, uh, every, every level. level of baseball uh, in consecutive years with the same organization. Now, Didn't these, know that. Wow. Yeah, I mean, here's uh, I've got I've got some bling here I brought for you guys. That was in Lynchburg. Following year in Jackson, we had Double A, took took the crown there. Next year, Tide Ward eighty five. Yo, Tide Ward Tides. Tide Ward Tides won again, and of course, the big one, nineteen eighty six. Well, before we get to, before we get to um, all all the. Well, the pageantry of the 86. Let's talk about your major league debut. You're brought up, and it's against the Dodgers. It's a hell of a debut you make. You wind up going two for three. You catch a run of stealing. What was that, man? Like, like after the journey that you went on to finally get to that pinnacle, what, what do you feel? Do you go out and celebrate that night? Like, what's going through your head? <laughs> uh, well, I was about pooping in my drawers for five innings or so, but, uh, <laughs> but I carried that load to second base well on that ground rule double, and I was – uh, as you said, I was two for two in my first two at bats, and I'm leading the league. I should have quit then, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. I, you know, I have a speaking uh, video introduction when I I speak all over the country in spring minutes, and one of the clips is uh, Ben Scully and his partner Joe Garagiola announcing my second at bat because the the first game of the week ran long, so they caught up with us, and I was just coming up to bat my second time, and. Uh, <laughs> Scully said, yeah, this kid here, young man, uh, catching for Gary Carter, uh, you know, he's six foot three, 208 pounds. He had an appointment to the West Point Military Academy. He would have made an impressive looking general. And crack. It was almost like they edited it together. It was too, too good. I mean, it was just, it, 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 was, it was like it was made up. But, it, you know, Scully's a Hall of Fame announcer. And, well, I didn't, wasn't a Hall of Fame player. It never was. But, uh, but I felt like it at that time. You miss the good old days of like really great sportscasters like Vince Scully and Graziola and Phil Rizzuto. And then now we're just, just stuck with say Joe. Rizzuto, yeah. We're just stuck with Joe Buck now. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. Why does everybody hate Joe Buck? Because he's he not New good. York. He hates everybody. He says that I read actually his book is pretty funny. I'll give him credit. He goes, everyone thinks I hate on them. It's like Boston fans think I hate the Red Sox. Yankee fans think I hate them. He's like, I don't hate anybody. It's just, it's not. I got to show the passion for the for the moment and just people wonder. Like, I'm not a Joe Buck fan, believe me. I'm more of a Dwayne Stats, Tony Kubek, MSG Yankees kind of fan. That's my uh, hearkening. But uh, yeah, Buck is bad. But there's no one worse than than McCarver and Buck when they're already together. Oh, you can hear oh them. My. Yeah, right. I know. I know. Oh you could hear them high fiving whenever a Yankee would strike out. Those two just. Especially well, when Harper, what about the Harper legendary and, Hawk Harrelson? Oh, oh put it on the board. Yes. Uh, geez, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, the day, there's a lot of good things about the game that aren't the same, gentlemen. No. So, oh, yeah. So, Ed, uh, I want to ask you. So, I've been able to interview guys like Lenny and Doc and Darrell and Hojo and Kevin Mitchell, all great guys. But back in 86, how wild was that team off the field? <laughs> Did you read the book, The Bad Guys Won? I did, yeah. It's great. <laughs> my mom read that and she said, Oh my God, if I had known that was going on, I would have come and got you out of there. <laughs> it was about it was about seventy percent of everything. It was really good good book. I was shocked that the guys talked as much as they did. But you know, on a scale of one to a hundred, how much of it was true? Well, all of it in the book is true, plus about thirty more percent of the same stuff. And who was your pal on that team? Did you have a buddy? You know, I, I, uh, Gary, Gary Carter was, was a friend, a mentor. Uh, I respected him. He was a good guy. You know, not everybody liked Gary. Uh, and I came to know later on that, you know, he, he could be a little selfish and think about himself too much. But, um, you know, I, 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 I Tim Tuffle was a good guy. Randy Neiman set me up with the, uh, the greatest woman in the world. Your wife. My wife, exactly right. right. Um, that is a great story. I mean, I would not be here if it wasn't for my wife, Trish. So, but, uh, you know, I didn't hang, I, you know, you got the scum bunch, right? Roger McDowell, Doug Sisk, uh, Danny Heap, Danny uh, Wally Heap. Backman. Oh, my goodness. Uh, 
that they were they 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 loved themselves. They the scumbags were the scumbags, and uh, it, it just nothing that happened was really a surprise. In '86, you guys were involved in in a, in a couple of. Uh, of well-known brawls on the field. What can you tell us about that famous one in Cincinnati between Eric Davis and uh, Ray Knight? Yeah, what can I tell you is you can see Ray Knight could, could fight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he threw a, a one-two combination that was you know, worthy of any boxer. Absolutely. Be, yeah, before Eric knew what hit him. Yeah. He, he popped, popped him just boom, boom, like that. It was just incredible. Uh, and Eric's no slouch, that's for sure. Uh, and then and he of course, was a friend of the straws, right? Huh? Was well, a good friend oh, yeah. of the straws. Yes, he was. Yep. Uh, but he was he got crazy that night, boy. And they had some they had some bad dudes on that Reds club, Charlton and um, a couple of big old boys. It was Dibble yeah, on that yeah, team yeah, as well. Dibble, Dibble, the nasty yeah. boys, the nasty boys. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. Was Randy Myers still on that team? Mm, can't tell you about that one. Because he kind of bounced around a little bit, but they they wound up winning a little bit with that. So was was there bad blood going into that game, or was it just everyone was out to get the Mets? Yeah, that that's more what it was. It wasn't any, any bad blood <laughs> there. It was just, I mean, we were cocky. I mean, everybody hated us. Uh, we came with an attitude to every game, and um, you know, everybody wanted a piece of us, but very few got it. You know, uh, they almost got us in the postseason though, but. That's that's a whole nother story, <laughs> but yeah, it was it was great. I mean, it was a it was it was kind of a throwback to like the the old twenty twenty Yankees nineteen twenties of the those nasty guys back then running and partying like animals. Uh, that team was was you know, but but I, I tell people, look, they haven't won since, um, and I think character is important important part of a long term success. And you know, we had characters, but in many areas we didn't have the character. <laughs> took to sustain um, their winning ways. You also kind of were known uh, on the team. I know McDowell had a reputation, but you were no slouch in this department playing pranks. Now I heard, I heard through, through the grapevine, you did something to Calvin Giraldi. Oh, is that the only one? No, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the oh. one that our buddy told me to ask you about. He asked oh, me to ask, ask him about the Calvin Giraldi uh, prank. Well, as you're leaning into that, I'm thinking, all right, which one's he going to bring up here? What's, <laughs> how many of the hundreds here? But uh, so uh, Giraldi, so so Calvin and I, uh, he was drafted the '83, so we roomed together when he came out of the University of Texas. He was drafted ahead of Clemens, uh, and both of them were pitched at the same time at Texas. He comes to Lynchburg. The next year, we roomed together in Jackson. The next year in, in Norfolk, in AAA, we roomed together again. So we're good friends. Uh, as as uh, a matter of fact, uh, in uh, well, I'll get to that. If you ask me about uh, what happened in the World Series with Shiraldi and one of his relatives, that's another fun story. But uh, that's the one. That's oh, the one. Is that the one you want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> you mean the one where like his sister came to Boston, not expecting to go back to New York? And uh, his sister and I kind of got along pretty well, sort of, kind of. Um, <laughs> got along. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a little long distance thing, but it was, you know, we made, uh, you know, reach out and touch someone. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but so all of a sudden she wants to come, they're winning three games to two. And she wants to come to New York because they're winning. And like, well, I don't care about that. I'm not happy. So she, you know, he asked her brother. <laughs> Calvin said, well, I ain't got tickets. You made your own stupid decision. And so she came to me and she, she I mean, she got me cave in. And uh, <laughs> and then how am I going to get there? I'm like, I don't know. Talk to your brother. He says, I ain't got no, what do you mean? You want me to get a taxi for you? So she comes back to me. I said, look, all right, I like you a lot. Hon. And you know what? You're going to be my date on the Mets charter. <laughs> now, you tell me which one of them other boys there had to had the enemy's <laughs> uh not daughters uh sister you know uh and what i just what i what i call it was that was great advanced scouting see you still friends with <laughs> calvin yeah yeah all right so, okay, stay so touch. i got so at, at game six here's what's happening randy neiman had introduced me 
by Cupid's story, it's beautiful, you got to read in a book about my wife. Well, I had only met this girl who was going to be my wife about two weeks, three weeks before the World Series. And I gave her tickets to home games, you know, I mean, uh, I thought she was a great gal, and, you know, but we hadn't really gotten going. And so uh, at one end of my 12 or 13 tickets, sitting next to my dad was Calvin Sorrelli's sister, Rhonda. On the other end of my tickets, 12, 13 seats away, was my future wife of 30 some years now. Uh, my dad tells me, if you ever do that thing again, son, I will beat your ass. Because <laughs> Rhonda was bawling, sitting right next to him. My dad actually, in both six and seven, had to take her up into the the walkways and get her out of away from the stand. She was crying so bad. Well, game so six, took, game six isn't that the game that sure all the um. Uh, uh, breaks down. He has a breakdown. Game seven, the man. game seven, too. Yeah. He was a part of the comeback there. So yeah. she's on my ticket. She's falling right there in the Mets section. My dad had to get her out so she wouldn't be too embarrassed. But and my dad's wanting to go, kick his ass, kick his ass, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> he knew Calvin. But uh, I guess he didn't tell you the rest of the story, though. The story gets better. So Calvin finally, he picks a girl from Jackson to get married. So so I drive up there. I'm in this party, wedding party. And I got there the first night. None of the guys were there. Clemens was coming, Kelly Gruber, Spiko, and there was five of the six of his grooms were, were, were big leaguers. So I got there the night first, say it was uh, uh, Wednesday night. Everybody was supposed to come in Thursday. I got there. Cal was a big drinker from Texas, man. He can put away the beer. So I took him out and treated him on everything. Well, he was just flat hammer. And I was... Uh, Whew, I was a little south of the wind too, but uh, we he, we only made it to my back to my motel. Calvin passed out in, in my motel room. Well, I happened to wake up about six thirty in the morning, and I don't know how I was had enough clue to do this, but I found his keys laying on the uh, the desk in the motel room. So as bad as I felt, I still went down to the hardware store and got them all copied. <laughs> So the boys uh, come into town that day, and we have a rehearsal dinner, right? And after rehearsal dinner, I had a car and Calvin had a car. So Calvin takes half of my take half. We're supposed to meet at this bar. Well, I informed the boys that we got a stop to make here because I look what I got, all his keys. So we're going to his apartment. So about four of us go into the apartment. And the best that we did was um, we took some athletic cakes, stored in half, and on the bottom of his left shoe, we put H-E. On the bottom of his right shoe, we put LP. You know what that spells? Sure. Help. Help. <laughs> so the next day, Calvin didn't notice. But the problem was, this is a big Catholic wedding with a priest. Had, had that hat. It was about six foot tall. He was a big time dude. About 350 people. And it's getting late into the service. We're like, dang it. Is he going to kneel or what? Finally, the Final blessing, down they go for the on their knees. And his dad in the front row, he bellered first, and the whole place just came down. <laughs> so, I got a picture of this. It's awesome. <laughs> so, um, and his wife didn't like buggy things, so I put three dozen crickets, live crickets in, in their car. Uh, <laughs> I put, um, I put a, a full piece of Lindberger cheese on his engine block. Uh, oh. Still, oh, nasty, bad. So, you know, we you got a streak, of, my man. <laughs> yeah, but listen, listen, he came back though a year and a half later. He dated your sister. <laughs> no, he, he wasn't as good as me, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have to invite him to the wedding. So, we get to re reception, rehearsal dinner. And I gave all my guys, you know, your wedding parties, I gave them some hearing, some nice phone earphone things and um and it, except for calvin i gave him a, a a two by three size uh picture of the 86 mets <laughs> oh <laughs> so he bangs on his glass ding, ding, ding. he's six foot seven he stands up and he says well folks listen it's payback time and he took took him through the story of what i did to him and, he, and they reached underneath his chair he had a black double bag. And he said, one day, we was in Norfolk, Virginia. I had 
I got me a new camera. So I was sitting there in the living room, and y'all may not know, but Ed used to he used to sleep in the buff. And he got up from a nap one afternoon, was heading to the kitchen, and I was playing my camera, just fired off a thing to see if it went off. Well, it did. And he said, I kept it. So here, and he pulls out 15 shirts, the Ed Hearn Fanny Club, <laughs> with a picture of me all backside here. <laughs> the next day, 250 people, yeah, he, he had uh, four by sixes of that picture alone. So I spent about three quarters of my rehearsal or reception signing my naked butt. Nice. <laughs> so let's change gears here a little bit and let's get everybody involved in this. Uh, so what are what is everybody's thoughts about the upcoming baseball season? Because we are from this day forward, we are three exactly three weeks away from opening day. What do we think is going to happen? Is that going to happen? We're going to finish it up. What's before, thoughts, before we get to that, I just got to say, Ed, there must be no more person in this world who is thankful that they did not have smartphones and cameras and back in the 86 Mets locker room or on the planes. <laughs> you guys would all be in fucking jail. I'm pretty sure about that. Well, we all were at one time. But, uh... <laughs> I mean, longer, longer than that. <laughs> Can you imagine Twitter or, oh, or Facebook geez. or anything oh. back then? Yeah, Danny Johnson would have been fired five times by that point because he couldn't he couldn't yeah. show that for that long. Jesus. Ten four on that, yeah. Yeah. So let's go back to the my my question. What are what are our thoughts about the upcoming baseball season? Three weeks from day, opening day. What do we think? Yankees forty two wins, eighteen losses. Mets twenty four wins, and twenty four wins. They're getting the Tigers as losses. many as that. <laughs> Yeah. Tigers are 21. I just heard the over-unders That's yesterday right. in Russo. I think the Yankees are seven, uh, 37, seven. seven and a yeah. half. Yeah. What do you think, Ed? Well, I'll tell you what I think. My last pod show I did, the guy says, what do you think about today's player? Who is, who is the guys you really like to watch? And I was like, oh, crap. I don't watch this damn game today. So the guy was a Yankees fan. I said, well, oh, hey, you, you know, you guys got that guy named Judge. Yeah, he's a good, fine player. I like watching him. Oh, and the Mets across town, uh, they have a guy named Polar Bear, right? I don't know. I don't follow this game. I got to be honest with you. 1994, uh, two days. I mean, I'm I have I'm two days, two years into my first kidney transplant, and these guys strike, and we have no World Series. I was done with it. Is that I, it? I, it, it? Eighty from '94 on, you basically checked out of baseball. Wow. Yeah. wow. That how was a rough. Feel, how does it feel to have a World Series trophy uh, from the Mets, knowing it's going to be the last trophy they ever win? <laughs> <laughs> not, not even on PlayStation, they can win one. <laughs> God, you are hard, brother. Yeah, we're Yankee fans. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, but you know what? Nobody's perfect. You guys, hang on. Don't worry about it. <laughs> He will <laughs> to a 27th title. <laughs> exactly. Oh, most, again, most, no, most of your titles were before there was even television, Kevin. Relax. Hey, listen, yeah, I, I argue this point all the time, okay? <laughs> yes, we went through a very great period in oh, the, the late 90s, were great 2000s. for the Yankees. The 80s great were great period. for but, the Yankees. But when I grew up and when Sean grew up, we were dog shit from yeah. the fucking early to mid-80s till 90 fucking four. Yeah. 93, you can even argue, because they finished second then. 94, they should have won the World Series against the Expos. I will go to my grave saying they would, and that would have been a dynamic one. And it but they happened suck. in the playoffs, right, Ed? Yeah, yeah. But for a good 10, 12 years as Yankee fans, we ate shit, which is, you know. You guys take calls, callers here. I got to get some damn Met fans on there. I'm Back with you, man. It, it's, it's me and you against these two jabronis. I sat um, through the whole Dale Berra, Bobby Meacham, Mike Pagliarulo. Claude L. Washington, R.I.P. Oh, yeah. I like Claude L. Washington. He played for the Mets. Yeah. He was a good Albero player. Espinosa, those days. Oh. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do we think about, like, these new rules that they're going to be throwing in? The three pitcher, you know, the pitch has to pitch, hit uh, uh, face at least three batters. Um, uh, the extra inning rule. I mean, is, does that bastardize the game? Oh, totally. It's yeah. great when you go into extra innings and you put the guy on second base automatically. And when he gets back to home, he gets a snow cone on top of all of it. <laughs> this is literally bullshit. I hate exactly. it. Exactly. There you A Yankee fan got the answer. Yeah. Little league <sighs> bullshit is right. I mean, 
I don't. What happens after fourteen innings? Just put up a T ball instead, so the pitchers don't have to worry about working the next day. Exactly. Don't want to hurt your foot. I'll, tell you what, I'll, I'll take just for this year and the COVID situation. I'll take devil's advocate, but for next year, I don't want to see that shit because they're going to uh, have okay. so many games and so sh- and so small of a time frame. You can't be tiring guys out fifteen innings and then having because you're not going to have many off days. That's for sure. So you can't okay. do that to these guys. That's the only. But next year, I don't want to see any of this bullshit. I'm a purist as well, but I will say this. I do want the DH for both leagues. This ninth spot in the pitcher is fucking stupid. Kevin, once you implement the DH, that's not going to go away. They've been fighting that yeah. forever. I think the National League yeah. is still the only league that has a pitcher hitting. Yeah, well, that's the way well, it is. Well, there's only two leagues, Born. dopey. Yeah. That's no, no, no. I'm, but I'm talking about in college. <laughs> I'm talking about oh. in, in Little League and Babe Ruth. I'm talking about throughout throughout the country. You know, the Major League Baseball, the National League is the only league that has a pitcher hitting. Everywhere else, it's a there's a DH. So I think I think we've seen the last of the uh, pitcher hitting. Do you know that they it, they tried out several of these things and they haven't imp- implemented it yet? But of course, they got the the the, uh, the umpire with the strike zone digital thing. But another thing they tried out was uh, that a batter's up to the plate, any count, ball gets away from the catcher, he can steal first. That's horrible. I mean, they're worried about the length of the time of the game, and yet they're doing things like this. They, they're, they're playing around with making the pitcher step off the rubber to throw to a base. That's so going to lengthen the game. What does it in the game then? What, you know, do you keep the batter in the batter's box? You know, stop with the adjusting of the, of the, of the uh, batting gloves and all the other equipment. You know, once you're in the batter's box, you stay in the batter's box. But, I mean, other than that, what can, you know, the game is the game. That's the way it is. I mean, and, and I think – you know the the person who wants to have the second the, the guy on second base and and all the and and this crazy rule you're just talking about are they really baseball purists and do they even care about the game is that the audience you're looking to attract? They're Let's just see. worried. Well, it, they're just worried about losing baseball because young people are more in it. NFL and NBA by far. And if they they got to get the young kids now, otherwise, because when we all die off, no one's going to give a shit about baseball anymore. Is the bottom line. Kevin, you got it, baby. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right on. So does that mean? Unfortunately, the, does that mean in the future now they start building smaller stadiums and the contracts that you see out there now these are going to be a thing of the past in the next 10, 15 years? I hope not. I tell you, uh, I, you know, there's a lot of things I hope don't happen in the future, and it goes beyond baseball. But uh, right now, uh, I am I am deeply sad, uh, saddened about. Not only the game, but stuff that's going on in this country. So, oh. I mean, uh, I, it's just, anyway, get back to baseball. But you know what? Uh, I just can't. I, it's just ridiculous. Well, I think that's what the country needs right now. We need some type of diversion. There's nothing out there for anybody. You know, at least in life, you need some type of hope. You need you need something. Every day that's you why- put on the, the news, is there anything that's, that's encouraging? No. And that's why baseball had such a great opportunity Absolutely. here to step up to the plate. Both these people, both of them, the, the players and MLB, both. It was hey, a Ed, perfect opportunity. Ed, who they, side did you take here with the, the recent labor discussions about players versus the owners with the, in regards to the contracts? I mean, I'm, I'm going to guess players, but I'm sure you, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it a player, a player side you're on with this, with the whole Corona and uh, and the and the contracts and such? They're both equally as bad. Okay. Now, if you take me back to '94, I wanted the owners to lock the players out, bring the kids up, and in two years you got all the superstars you need, and you just the hell with this I I me me money stuff. It gets old to me. I mean, you know, I just saw a, a post of today about. Everybody gets on the Mets about uh, uh, what's uh, what's the fellow that's getting paid? Well, uh, Bonilla. Right. How, how much money he's getting paid? Somebody posted. He's getting paid guys. almost a million and a half a year. So is Bruce Souter. So is a ton of these guys. I mean, yeah. the list. I just had no idea. I mean, that's. You know, I understand the I understand the both aspects of it. You know, and. And I took some heat on it because I put a post up on, on Facebook about it too. But my what theory the is, uh, well, my theory is with the players. Okay, I understand uh, you want the prorated salaries, blah, blah, blah. But think of the 50 million Americans that are not working right now. 
right? These guys who work on, you know, assembly lines or, you know, whatever they do, and they're making $40,000 a year. And they, tell, they get told they can go back to work, but they got to make $28,000, right? That's a big cut. That's a big dip in your salary. You're making 13 million and they want you to take nine. Pick up, yeah, the, bat play, yeah. pick up the bat and fucking hit the ball. This, this is where the play is come off looking bad, but they this- can kiss my butt. <laughs> how, 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 can the, how can these freaking players look at the people that walk out on the field with the flag before the game? How can they look them in the freaking eyes? For the owners in the box, they were losing how much? You know, a couple, you know, two hundred million, and every year, how much gain are they making in the last ten years? Right here, that's what I got to say. The uh, reason why I think the players fought so much here is why they got their asses smoked in the last player negotiation. They got smoked. The owners handed their asses to them. This was more of a stand saying, "We're not going to take in the ass this time." Again, because there's, be, there's another labor contract up, not next year, 2021, but 2022. There's probably, everyone's saying, going to be another strike because no team, n- neither side is going to cave right. in. That's but, why they went to That's why they went to the mat this time and said, fuck you, we got smoked last time. We're going to get ours this time. That's what we the got, players said. You dead on, Kevin. We got Thank bad you. news coming ahead. And this is bad right now for the game, losing right. face and not stepping up to the plate. But when they pull this stuff again, I mean, that's gonna happen, and we've are. It used to be baseball, apple pie, and Chevrolet. Now it's that communist sport you kick around. Damn ball! You can play in the woods back in the caveman. They're they're <laughs> loving that game over America's game. It's over. Well, you know what? You got to put some of this on the owners because they had the perfect opportunity to bring the sport back. July Fourth. It really would have been a great uh, uh, PR move. Uh, it was something that the country really could have used and because they wanted to hold out for just some money. I mean, greed. You can't get on the side of the owners when they say that they're losing money, but yet no one's really selling the team. They're making enough money. They're huge. Owners huge came money. out looking like they came out looking like the bad guys during this mm-hmm. whole thing. Well I mean you look though they at a time like this in America where people were needing something, all right, you gotta come together and you got to give a little. But unfortunately, what's going on in baseball is the microcosm of the crap going on in America. It's the greed. That's, that's what I'm worried about. Greed, greed. selfishness. I, I, me, me, greed. What's in it for me? And I don't care about you. That's it. And you're, in the long term, the sport's going to suffer. Um, yeah. In the long term, America's going to suffer, too. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it already is. Um, right now, let, let, let's switch things a little bit here. Uh, so you, you had mentioned previously that you were doing some type of uh, motivational speaking. Uh, before, before I ask you about that, I just want to say, how are you feeling these days? Like you, you also said you know, went through a, a, a kidney transplant. I know you, you had a bout with the uh, skin cancer. How are you feeling? How's your health? I mean, I'm okay. I'm, I feel good for how I feel. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, you know, I mean, uh, less than a year after, a year and a half after being out of the game with a shoulder injury that cut me short. Uh, I was on dialysis and had my first of what has been three kidney transplants, actually. Uh, I take an IV treatment once a month for this thing called hypogamma globulin anemia. I sleep with a breathing machine every night for, for severe central nerve sleep apnea. I've had, um, you know, because of immunosuppression and growing up in Florida and being out in the sun, I've had over 45 uh, squamous cell carcinomas removed their skin cancers. God but, damn. I mean, uh, that's, it's, uh, you know, I tell my, my, I don't even go to a dermatologist. I go to the Mo surgeon every three months religiously because he says I'm one of the top five most challenging patients he has. And this guy is locked up. So I'm, I'm like his annuity for Tahiti, first of all. I mean, it's ridiculous. And then secondly, though, I look at it as my weight loss program. All the meat he's cutting off of me. keeps me my weight down decent. <laughs> But how am I feeling? You know what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize there. it was such a loaded question. <laughs> it, took you, it took you a while there, Kevin. Hey, okay. No problem. <laughs> but how do I feel? Look, man, uh, you know what? Um, I went from the penthouse to the outhouse, and uh, the side effects of the medication on that first transplant took me down to the basement. I loaded 357, almost quit. But 
I've never been a quitter. I made a plan and I fought hard. And you don't, you don't want to hear my plan, but um, I came back. And, you know, I've had the opportunity for 25 years now or so to speak all over the country. I wrote a book, was on Oprah. But, you know, I take 35 to 40 pills a day. And the best medicine I can take is when I have the opportunity to make a difference in somebody else's life. And is that where the motivational speaking comes in? Oh, my God, yes. I hate the word motivational. It's, it, I mean, you can't motivate anybody. That's, that's like one and done. It's, it's reaching, it's using the personal story to, to cut through the armor we all have. The, oh, I don't need this talk or anything. But you use that story to get people to open up. And then you plant seeds in there. And then you water and fertilize seeds that are inside there. And then, you know what, the, my best medicine is in two files, one on my computer and one in the cabinet, hard copy and digital emails. I've had people say, I took two books to the hospital with me, your book and the Bible, and your book got me through what I went through. Wow. I've had people tell me about saving their life and changing their life. And I didn't want to go to that damn meeting. Oh, but I'm so glad I did. You were talking directly to me. And this happens all the time. And you ask me how I feel. You know what? I don't feel great all the time. I get down. I still have some darn pity parties once in a while. But, you know, I go into that, one of these folders and I start reading. And, man, I'm telling you, it's, it lifts me up and it carries me. It floats me over the rough waters of life. Uh, because, yeah, I don't feel great all the time. None of us do. But if you give of yourself, reach out to help other people, it's going to come back to you and it gives you, that's the juice of life as far as I'm concerned. I should, I should, I should feel like crap all the time, but it's giving it away and somebody coming up to you and say, man, thanks for being there. That's so much better than I could have played 15 years in the big leagues and not had the opportunity to do some of the things I've been able to do. Uh, I, I had a CEO of a Fortune 500 company pull me in a private room after speaking to a thousand of his people and he put his head down and he cried like a baby. He said, nobody's ever talked to me that way. You were talking to me, Ed, and he bawled like a baby. Did you, take guy, a, did you take a picture with Trump then or no? No! <laughs> nice. You, you are you. good, brother. Thank boom, you. boom. That was a nice spot. <laughs> I, I set you up on a T a little bit, didn't I? A little bit, you did. I said, I, I can go a million ways with this one. Do I go yeah. Bill Gates? I'm like, nah, it's, that's, let's, let's nah. go bigger. Let's go Trump. No, what the hell? No, and you know what? Uh, you, you Always know, the low hanging fruit food. there, Kevin. Always. Oh, the low stop it, Jeff. Fruit. You're just mad because I cracked the bed and you didn't, you mullet face ass. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> but you know what? Kevin, Kevin gets it. You guys get it because. You, what you guys all, all three of you guys do is, is you are a distraction and, and to, to people's lives. And there's a lot of struggling going on today, gentlemen, not just Mets fans. <laughs> That's true. The only problem though, Ed, is only one of us is, is uh, successful and he's wearing a black shirt. So. <laughs> oh like, man. But you know like what? Says the guy lives in, says the guy lives in Bayonne of all people. I know. I always thought about doing motivational speaking. I really did. I really did. My problem is I genuinely don't like people. I was going to say, how can you motivate? You don't like anybody. You I like three everybody. people on this planet. <laughs> you guys are bad dudes, man. Oh, yeah. Big time. Ed, what like, kind of music did you listen to in the locker room? Or what, do you, oh, what kind of you listen to, do you still listen to these days? We're talking some tunes now, right? Yeah, let's, go, yes, let's talk about it. You guys talk about that. And that had me really worried. Because, man, I can't carry a note in a freaking 50 We don't want you to fucking. sing. <laughs> I know, but okay, I do. I think. So I told you when you asked me that on, you know, before we got together, I said, uh, Barry White. Barry White, yeah. I love Barry White. Yeah. You know, when you're a teenager, you're on the East Coast of Florida, you get a little fire cooking down there with mama, and then your lady and Barry comes on there and he talks to you right through it all, baby. Yeah. Baby. Is that how you got Calvin Chiraldi's sister with Barry White? <laughs> I can't let it. I cannot give that up, baby. That's, 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 no, no. Yeah. It was actually Lou Rawls, man, for, for Rhonda. <laughs> so you like that kind of like sexy kind of like mood music. 
Well, I thought, you know, I mean, I was I was a dedicated ball player working for a dream, but you know, you got to take some time off and have some some chill and some fun, and you know, that's I was all I was, you know, and the women they all like me because you know they're they're only human. I mean, right? Yes, sir. Well, what music was played in the locker room? Was there, were there fights about the music, or did everybody oh, was there yeah. something everyone kind of agreed upon? Uh, that can be that can go back and forth. If you're winning, it's anything. If you're losing, things aren't going good. It gets a little feisty. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know one song that wasn't played a lot: "New York, New York." Lamp, no. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know the squeaky squeaky uh, wheels get the oil, right? So yeah. you know who the squeaky ones are, right? So you know what's playing, right? Yeah, Jesse Orozco and that goddamn mariachi music probably, right? <laughs> no, that's part of it. That's exactly part of it. A lot of menudo for Jesse Orozco, huh? <laughs> oh, my goodness. But, uh, you know, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed a lot of music, man. I, I enjoy uh, Lionel Richie. Oh, man, just love this. And Lionel. Uh, Willie Nelson, Hank Williams. Uh, I just, it's a, I'm a situational music guy. I just, uh, you know. You're all over the map. I love that. I am. I'm not tied down. I'm not a fan of anybody's. My wife can tell you, I'm, I'm, if she hears this, she'll go, how did you remember those people's names? You never remember anybody's name. Well, Charlie Daniels. I like a hot keyboard, too. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, when he banged that keyboard. Oh, boy, I love that. And that 14-year-old? Yeah. <laughs> 13. 14 would be wrong, Kevin. And his oh, cousin. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's talk about Elton then. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> we want to well, go with this one, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Too door. easy. Yeah. Yep. 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 So, but I, 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 I had one song that I really, really came to love. Uh, this Caribbean Calypso song. Uh, have you ever heard of the, the Big Bamboo? No. No, it's not. That? The Great no. Porno or no? No, it's the Great Bamboo. Um, the, the big bamboo, no? All right. No, never heard, heard it. So I asked my woman, what could I do to make her happy, faithful, and true? She said, Eddie, all I want from you is a little piece of the big bamboo. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Well, Kevin and Jeff know nothing about that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Get the twins Meanwhile, out, we're the huh? ones with kids, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> no, Kevin, I'm the one with cash. You. <laughs> Got you there. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, uh, where, where are you doing your thing at, man? Do it all over. Right now, in my house, because this fucking virus isn't letting anybody leave. <laughs> There's uh, nowhere. <laughs> New York, Jersey, but primarily that's the main area. Sometimes Vegas, Vegas once a year, too. I get out there for, uh, go bet on NFL and hang out. But yeah, I do it in Vegas, too. But, Very nice. Yeah. You know, you know an up-and-comer named Jack Clunan? Yes, yeah, I, I do. do. Yeah. I do, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's I just worked with him, actually. He's a nice kid. Yeah, he's a great kid, man. That guy, you know what? We hooked up when he was six years old. I was in Cooperstown, New York, signing my book, sitting next to a bunch of Hall of Famers. I don't know why I was there. And his dad walked up to my table and he's looking at my book. He says, Oh, you've had a kidney transplant. I said, Yes, sir. And he says, Jack, come here. He pulls this little guy up and he goes, This is my son, Jack. He's had three liver transplants. He had them before he's age three. Yeah. Really? And then, and, and I just had this kid under my wing now for 20 plus years. Uh, he went through leukemia, almost died. I, I think we're each other's biggest in, in, inspirations. And he always told me, man, because of all those health issues, you got to laugh. And he, and he kept telling all these medical jokes. And I said, dude, you need to write this stuff down. And he says, I have been. And so when he first started off, I was like, you know, he, he was at those ones where you got to, you got to bring 20 people to drink if, oh, yeah. if you want to get up there type thing. Yeah. Those but, are the ones that Kevin and Jeff still do. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the Joe Lozner specials that Sean loves? Uh, I, oh, is this going to be two weeks in a row with Lozner? You two know why? Two in a row. I, I, I'll, tell you why you know, I'll tell you why I say that. This is a red herring because Bron Barb has sent me that. He goes, go listen to Minute Marker 25. And then Sean Warren started shitting on him. I started laughing. They go, I'm definitely going to bring that up today. I promise you. You waited until an hour into the show, but somehow yeah. we got a Joe Lozner reference two weeks in a row. That's yeah. not supposed oh. to happen. Yep. Ugh, what a garbage human being. Well, Jack, Jack is so <laughs> Jack is such a great human being. Yeah, he's, he's he, a great he kid. kept applying for to to be an EMT in the yeah. fire department over and over. And they kept rejecting because he's been through yeah, so much man. crap. He almost died. They finally let him in. They told him, "Son, don't expect us to give you nothing," and he didn't. 
and he's in. And right now, he's in the middle of COVID-19 after he almost died of cancer, has three liver transplants and more medical stuff than you can shake a stick at. And, you know, I just watched him. He sent me a video. He pumped off like 40 pull-ups in a row. And I'm like, dude, man, all you guys do is sit around and work out or what? But he is he's funny as heck. And from the speaking that I've done, I've been able to coach you a little bit about, you know, pause and uh, rhythm and stuff. And um, he's coming along great. Uh, he begged me one time when I was out in the city doing an autograph show. Hey, I'm on, I'm on a show tonight on the island. Hey, can you come by? I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. I get there and he's like, dude, I want you to do five minutes. And I'm like, dude, I don't do five minutes. <laughs> Just five minutes, man. Come on, just get up. Just you're funny as hell. I said, man, I don't. I, I'm not a comedian. I, I'm humorous when I speak. Yes. And he just begged me. You know, the dude's been through so much. I gave in, and I got up there before him, uh, and this lady comedian introduced me. And hell, they had to pull me off. I mean, I was on a roll. <laughs> and Jack comes up to me. He goes, how in the hell am I going to follow that act, man? You should have told him, say, tell the story where I put Munster cheese on Calvin Chiraldi's car, uh, engine block. Tell yeah. that story. <laughs> yeah. Or the one where, you, where I put uh, uh, tuna eyes on Kevin Mitchell hanging from his locker after we'd been fishing the day before. Loved, he must have loved that. <laughs> oh, the brothers. Yo, you should hear him tell that story. Oh, my God. Yeah, He's I brought, actually one of the nicest guys I've ever met. What a What a great guy. He's, he, I just talked to him. He's gotten on Facebook now, and he thinks he's Mr. Uh, was it FaceTime or Lifetime or something? He's on there all the time. He calls me up. Come on, Eddie, I'm going to go live, man. <laughs> oh, jeez, boy. I tell you, this COVID has changed things, man. People doing yeah. some strange things. Kevin Mitchell on on FaceTime. Oh, brother. Whew. Kevin but Mitchell on FaceTime. the world, man. Yeah. A good man. A good guy. You, you know, good. you asked me. Who would I want to be in a in a foxhole with? Kevin Mitchell and John Gibbons. Definitely not a Cleveland Indian. No. <laughs> no, 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 they will too easily. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> perfect. This this went great, guys. Uh, we really appreciate uh, Kevin Ed. We really appreciate you guys coming on and giving us your time. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a hoot. It. I loved it. Kevin, it's great to see you, man. Hey, nice I'll to meet you too. What a ball we had here today with you. It's good uh, stuff. I gotta get I gotta get your contact information. I gotta come see you do your thing, man. Sure, I'd love to see that. It'd be great. I, I, get... I, I don't I don't want to see what you do at home by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it right now. I'm a multitasker, <laughs> guy damn it. He's lefty. <laughs> oh, no. How often are you up in New York? Oh, I get back probably three, four times a year. All right. So when this whole thing is over, uh, you know, you l let us know when you're going to come, uh, come around, you know, we'll, we'll get together. We'll give you some tickets to some shows and yeah, you know, we'd love to see you, man. We'd love to talk to you again. Yeah, man. I'd be up for it. I do want to do one of them shows on myself. Sure. <laughs> Just let as long know. as you bring, as long as you bring seven people, Ed, you can as do as, that. As long as you bring Jack yeah. with you, yes. Yeah, right. As as I and six Jack more people. Uh, yeah, six yeah, more paid admissions. Yeah. Joe Loza would love that. Talk to talk hey. to Comedy Pete down in the West Village with the clipboard. He'll help you out. <laughs> Comedy Pete. Oh man, no uh, one's safe on this show. This is a great episode. All right, guys. Oh my guys, god, it was. Thank you so much again. We really do appreciate your time. And uh, Ed, uh, before you go, uh, you have a book out, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Tell I us a little book. bit about that. It's been out for, you know, I wrote it in 1994. My son was two years old, and I didn't think I would be here when I was, when he was like a teenager, and I wanted him to to be able to still have a dad because I was, you know, I've been pretty sick and. Uh, it's it's an autobiographical book, life, baseball, and most importantly, there's life nuggets in there. Um, I do tell a few of my crazy stories, but uh, it's it's really a solid book. Uh, I I I mean, it's been go how many years is this? Almost thirty years, and people still buying. It's just an evergreen book, and it's great for for younger people too, because um, you know not everybody has a dad and folks, and you know to to show them the way. And this book is a good, it has some good stuff in it. Hey, do me a favor. It. I haven't worked in three months. Can you send me an autographed copy and make it out to dear highest bidder? 
<laughs> send me an address and you guys and i can mail them to you i'll send you each copy oh awesome. that'd be great i'd definitely take up on that guys thank you, thank you so much for this episode we really appreciate it let's yeah, get let's have guys uh plug in here about uh yes. gutting the sacred cow Yes, Gutting the Sacred Cow, the podcast where comedy meets film debate is on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, you name it. GuttingTheSacredCow.com. Go there every day. We have a new uh, blog up every day. We do movie news. We do uh, our list of 10, hashtag list of 10. Movies that we've recently seen, although not much to see except shit we've already watched. Uh, movie sequels that we've seen or don't want to see. So GuttingTheSacredCow.com as well. as You can pick up a t-shirt, a hat, mug, you know, bag, whatever. So gutting the sacred cow there, gutting the sacred cow podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Kevin Goatee.com. K E V I N G O T double E dot com. And check out Jeff Paul and Gutting the Sacred Cow. I believe he's episode four or five, where Jeff Paul rightfully slams space balls and what a piece of shit that is. So I hate both of you. I love it. And we'll, we'll, and we'll we see another another season of um Comics watching comics. comics watching comics. We will as soon as, as soon as another network pays for it. That's for sure. <laughs> we need some. We need some. Uh, we need some scene money here instead of good old KG fronting the money and uh, getting paid for views. So we're uh, we're in talks right now, though. We got a few people who are kind of, sort of, maybe interested. So cross your fingers. Let's let's get this off uh, Amazon and onto a network. All right, man. Let's let's hope for a better day ahead, everybody. Uh, enjoy your uh, your weekend. Enjoy the Fourth of July. Sean, parting words. Be safe and keep swinging. I can't top that. <laughs> All right. Take care, See everybody. Later, we'll guys. see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.